The outcry over college admissions scandals and the whole conversation around so-called Nepo babies shows people still believe the systems they live under are basically fair and meritocratic, or that they should be. I think you should be careful what you wish for. There are many ways you could approach the topic of meritocracy. On the one hand, it seems easy to argue there is no meritocracy. How could people like Jeff Bebos and Elon the Monkey Slayer possibly deserve millions of times more wealth and influence than the rest of us? But for a couple of reasons I'll get into, I'm not certain there's no meritocracy. Maybe there is. You'll be able to decide that for yourself. I'm going to argue meritocracy is undesirable even for the meritocrats at the top. I'm Chris, and welcome back to the channel that knows no barber. If you get thirsty but can only drink something if it tastes like candy, check out today's sponsor, Flavored Water in a Bottle. Flavored Water in a Bottle. Pay more for water. You know what they say, it's not who you know, it's whom you know. No, wait, that can't be it. It's not who you know. So you blow. Whatever they say, that's the last time I'm ever going to say whom. Whoever they are, I'm just glad they recognize that what you know and how good you are aren't the only factors that determine how far you go in life. Remember last week how I said the idea of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps has been twisted from being obviously impossible to just another slogan that serves the wealthy? Turns out the same is true of meritocracy. A meritocracy is a society or organization where influence and power are apportioned based on merit, like talent and effort. And it was originally portrayed as a dystopia. I think the meaning began to shift in the 1970s or 80s with the rise of Reagan, Thatcher, and neoliberal economics. Powerful people looked at the dystopia and saw an ideal. Margaret Thatcher said in an interview, I don't care two hoots what your background is. What I am concerned with is, whatever your background, you have a chance to climb to the top. Presumably because once you get to the top, the government begins to represent you. Stuff like the ladder-climbing metaphor set the propaganda ball rolling. And now politicians everywhere talk of equality of opportunity and leveling the playing field. Millions have followed in the Iron Zombie Lady's footsteps by respecting the rich and assuming they deserve their wealth and power, while looking down on the poor and assuming they're just lazy. We need to talk about deserve. I don't like this word. Who decides who deserves what and for what? You? Plato? Your boss? The government? IQ tests? I think for most people the answer is money. If you assumed we had a meritocracy, money would decide what we deserve. You can be a wonderful person, but if you run out of money, you no longer deserve food, shelter, or you know, to live. Some places are kind enough to offer you a jail cell, but others just let you freeze to death outside. People say you get paid based on what you can provide the market, but it depends. Who's the market? Management? Because that's who sets wages other than the law. And I've never seen employee pay rates that vary according to the precise amount of value the employee provides. Sure, hard work and talent might be what they're promoting, or they might prefer people they get along with, or people who kiss their asses, or maybe the promotion was just going to the boss's nephew all along, and your work was for nothing. But hey, maybe the real meritocracy was the friends we made along. I don't aspire to equality of opportunity, because it implies you have the opportunity to have things, but only if the people with all the money say you deserve it. To hear politicians describe it, equality of opportunity seems to mean everyone still works hard and falls into poverty in the same proportions, but there's no more racial discrimination in the workplace. Discrimination is just against the poor now. 
What an inspiring vision to work toward. Moreover, we're limited by assuming we should pursue opportunities as individuals, competing against one another, instead of pursuing collective goals as groups. The ladder is an apt symbol of the meritocratic ideal. While a ladder undoubtedly offers the opportunity to climb, it's a device that can only be used individually. You go up the ladder alone. Meritocracy legitimizes inequality and damages community by requiring people to be in a permanent state of competition with each other. It sweetens the poison of hierarchy by offering advancement through merit rather than money or birth whilst retaining a commitment to the very notion of hierarchy itself. It promises opportunity whilst producing social division. In the contemporary era, the promises of meritocracy have become increasingly loud and competitive participation has come to be presented as a moral obligation at the same time as the ladders have grown longer. If somebody deserves the wealth they have, presumably the poorest people deserve their misery. Extremes of wealth can only exist when there's extreme poverty to prop them up, as I explain here. So the poor are saddled with the triumvirate of deprivation, segregation, and stigma. But I don't understand how anyone could deserve those things. It's like saying they deserve a nasty illness. Why would we deserve to be deprived of the basics of life? People relatively higher in the social hierarchy might laugh contemptuously at people for being jealous and wanting something they don't deserve, but they might just want the freedom denied to them by the shitty system they live under. You can call them losers, and you'd be right, but in a system where only a few can win and everyone else has to trudge along in poverty, most of us are losers. Does that mean we deserve nothing, and the winners deserve to own everything and make our decisions for us, because they beat you in a race you never wanted to run? I've said before, we tend to assume things are legitimate the way they are, without regard to how things came to be this way. When people have something, unless they stole it illegally, we assume they deserve it. Which is fine if it's, say, your own home. But when you can own billions of dollars in assets, you have a lot of influence over people's lives. Conversely, if someone doesn't have something, we discuss them and form opinions on whether or not they deserve it. And you might have noticed the poor don't deserve much. It's been decided for them. There are other groups of people who are perceived as inherently not deserving. Hiring and promoting often exclude people for their race, gender, religion, disabilities, and criminal record. And if they do get hired, people in marginalized groups face harassment, so they're less likely to stick around and compete with others for the next promotion, which is the goal of harassment. Plenty of studies find that I, a white, male, cishet, English-speaking legal citizen, am more likely to get hired and make more money than someone who isn't one of those things, let alone all of them. These biases aren't always conscious. They're cultural and systemic, so they creep into your brain at various points in your life. So maybe the hiring person doesn't realize they never hire the black person or the Arab person who's applying, just that for some reason I didn't think they'd be a good fit. If people don't get hired in the first place or are quickly chased out, they don't get the chance to demonstrate their merit. And what about just discrimination by looks? We don't hear about it that much, but we know in the interview and in the workplace, short people have it harder than tall people, fat people have it way worse than thin people, older people are less likely to be hired than young people, and in general, just more conventionally attractive people get more perks, and others get the shaft. Unless, obviously, you're being hired by George Costanza. You're extremely attractive. You're gorgeous. I'm looking at you. I can't even remember my name. <laughs> So uh, I'm afraid this is not going to work out. Thanks for coming. George is the exception. We don't take these unavoidable biases in hiring and promoting into account when we think why people are in their positions. It's much easier to just use the word deserve. Nor do we ever consider genetic and environmental factors that might have led a person to develop skills and work harder. We don't select our genes. We don't select our parents or their incomes. We don't select our environments. We don't choose everything that happens to us. Why should providing for our basic needs depend on such factors? 
So when people imply the system we live under is somehow meritocratic, that the distribution of wealth and power is somehow legitimate, I don't know what they're talking about. People seem to have a board game understanding of how an economy works. You know, there are some simple rules and you compete as equal tokens on a level playing table. So everyone has the same chance to win. So I guess rich people played the game and followed the rules and poor people just kept landing on community chest. <laughs> If you want a more accurate idea of how our system works, imagine a board game you're forced to play using your own money, and whoever's in the lead gets to decide when to enforce the rules. Who believes in meritocracy? Well, it seems like the more money and power you have, or plan to have, the more likely you are to tell yourself the system is based on merit. The political editor of The Economist, for instance, wrote a book about how meritocracy is real, and it's great, because these awesome empires that killed and enslaved millions of people were meritocracies. Meritocracy is used to justify the grind or hustle culture and imply your hard work will pay off. Someone who ticks my boxes, the straight white guy who didn't grow up poor, might be inclined to believe racism, homophobia, misogyny, and poverty aren't really such a big deal. Sure, they're an inconvenience, but if you really worked hard, I'm sure you'd make it to the top. Systemic forces? What systemic forces? Point to these systemic forces or I win and it's a meritocracy. Because if it's systemic, you might have to read and think about it to understand. Well, who has time for that when you're judging other people? So we ignore the complicated stuff and take a simplistic, individualist approach to success. When individuals tell their stories, they want to appear better. So they claim to have these virtues that make them unique, and that's why they succeeded. There's a much better chance they got one lucky break after another, while others in the same position were denied one or all of them. The story of a person's success is really the story of the capitalist system, how it limits some behaviors and incentivizes others, how it gives us ladders to climb, risks to take, and competitions to win. And the winners that emerge are the ones we call successful, hardworking, risk-taking, and all the other capitalist compliments. The current right-wing argument regarding meritocracy is it doesn't exist because the system discriminates against white men. The right's fast-talking media darlings always bring up the advantages given to the handful of individuals who aren't cishet white men who benefit from affirmative action as proof that we don't live in a meritocracy. I don't know if they believe it, but they're saying it. And there's a reason. They claim to believe in meritocracy, and no doubt some do, while others know it's a great curtain to conceal discrimination. It's like when they say they're colorblind. I'm colorblind, so I don't discriminate because I don't see color. Unless I see a black guy in my neighborhood. Hmm. More recently, the right has been militantly attacking DEI, or Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion programs at universities and corporations. While I see DEI roughly the same way I saw CSR, or Corporate Social Responsibility, 20 years ago, just another way to legitimize corporations owning everything, there is the usual right-wing crusade behind their fake indignation. Ethan is online, just made a whole video about it, so check that out. But if you already understand white supremacy and its propaganda as a system, you know where this anti-diversity outrage comes from. Anytime it seems like people that the right doesn't like might be using their merit to rise in the world, it must be a conspiracy. To the right, a meritocracy is when things are run by straight white men. But let's imagine we ended prejudice and opened things up for everyone. How could a meritocracy work? In any ocracy, the people at the top decide who deserves what, not based on some objective criteria we've all agreed on, but to serve their own interests. For sure, people will say, when you hand decisions over to a machine, they become objective, but intelligent machines are programmed with the biases of the people who ordered to have them built in the first place. So, the same people who are making the decisions now. 
If machines are owned by corporations or states, they will be used to enslave us. If you design a system so only one person or a tiny percentage of the people who want to can be on the top, you're creating this artificial situation where people will fight each other to be the one who grabs the whole bag, rather than just sharing the money and other perks. There's no longer any way to determine who deserves what, because the people at the top of the hierarchy inevitably make decisions, allocate resources, and appoint people according to their own idea of merit. The vagueness of the idea of merit is to the advantage of anyone higher up in the hierarchy, because they can make their own stuff up. Our family worked really hard, and that's why we have all this money today. So how do you explain people who've worked really hard for generations and still have nothing? Maybe hard work wasn't the decisive factor. Our family took risks. But we only value risk-taking when the person succeeds, while there are plenty of poor people who took risks who were never rewarded for them. Did you have some other virtues that no one else did? Kindness? Bravery? Authenticity? Obviously not generosity. Or did someone else create the wealth and your family owned it, like all great accumulations of wealth? So merit clearly isn't about hard work or risk-taking, and if I'm wrong that it's about money, what else could determine an individual's merit, and how would you measure it? Would you observe everyone all the time to see how kind and honest they were being, how hard they were working, again, maybe according to some objective measure? Maybe we could have a central database to record every time we see someone helping an old person cross the street. How would you measure anyone's merit without raking over their life and eviscerating their privacy? I know, I know. You thought that was a rhetorical question, right? But China has answered it. China has long been assumed to be a meritocracy because you take this test to see who gets to be in the government. Who makes the test? Who decides what qualities to test for? Do those qualities make us better or worse people? because the government says so. But the Chinese imperial examination dates back like 1400 years. More recently, China's innovative totalitarianism is designing the ultimate tool for creating meritocracy, the social credit system. It's like FICO, the financial credit score in the US that ruins lives, but for everything and everyone. Everyone is tracked, ranked, shamed, and blacklisted according to government criteria. Don't worry. If you behave, you'll have all the rights the government of China grants its citizens. Like, um... Plus the occasional pat on the head, huh? And if you don't behave by, say, getting fines and owing money, you'll be socially isolated and economically destitute. China has found a way to translate meritocracy into a system of imposed morality. Silly China. We have it slightly better than that. Sure, the state gathers information on us from birth, we're constantly monitored and judged at school, then all our time at work under surveillance and fear of getting fired, and we're increasingly getting filmed outdoors and getting spied on by our phones. Sure, we're limited by credit scores and no-fly lists and bad tenant lists. Uh, where, where was I going with this? Ah, right. Meritocracy. It sucks for everyone in China, and everywhere else. We've talked enough about how hard it is on the majority. How does meritocracy affect the so-called elite? In the literature on meritocracy and inequality, at least regarding the US, there's a lot of emphasis on schooling. That schools are a driver of inequality because if you go to the right schools, you have a significantly better chance of getting ahead. Before reading, I was under the impression the relationship between supposedly better schools and financial success in the future isn't because the schools themselves were better, but for three other reasons you might have figured out too. First, if you're going to more expensive schools, your parents have money. So there's a much better chance you'll have money in the future, regardless of which school you go to. Second, 
We're swayed by our biases. So if we see someone comes from a quote unquote good school, they have the permanent glow of merit. So we're more likely to recommend and hire and promote them. Finally, at those schools, you meet the children of other people with lots of money, which is excellent networking as the parents are well aware. For sure, a kid would get more out of a well-funded school because there are more teachers and other resources with no overflowing classrooms or police. But most of what a child learns in any school will be of no use in the working world, least of all in an interview or while networking or doing whatever it takes to get that first job. What are they teaching at the rich schools that makes them so good? Are kids getting MBAs? What are they teaching at the poor schools that makes them so bad? That the sun revolves around the moon? But there are more recent developments that I hadn't taken into account in my assessment. Have you ever noticed how rich guys like to brag how much they work nowadays? In a meritocracy, the people with the money and power have to at least pretend to have earned it. If you know anything about inequality in the U.S., you might be aware the top 1% of households now captures about a fifth of total income, and the top one-tenth of 1% 1 captures about a tenth of total income. Compared to the period between 1950 and 1970, this roughly doubles the share owned by the top 1% and triples the share owned by the top one-tenth of 1%. 1 so the rich are taking a bigger share of the pie than ever. But it's not just from owning more stuff, like it used to be. Between two-thirds and three-quarters of these increases come from income. Even the richest people are working harder than they ever have. This book explains the history of the shift from idle rich to, as the author calls it, the superordinate working class. I'm just going to highlight a key point. Elite jobs of all sorts nowadays demand hours routinely as a matter of course that would have been thought unimaginable because degrading by an earlier, more genteel American elite. For centuries, the old order imposed a social taint on those who worked not from passion for honor and exploit or as a calling, but industriously for wages. But that stigma, which remained at mid-century, has today been entirely erased and even reversed. Elite workers across all fields now valorize long hours and conspicuously and almost compulsively publicize their immense industry, including through their habits of speech, as a way of asserting their status. Meritocracy makes effortful and industrious work, busyness, into a sign of being valued and needed, the badge of honor. The economic returns to schooling have consequently skyrocketed in recent decades, and especially at elite schools and colleges, double or even triple the returns to investments in stocks or bonds. This produces an astonishing segmentation of income by education. So yeah, they're rich, but if they want to stay that way, they might have to invest a lot more in themselves than ever. But once they have, they're ready. For nearly three decades, graduates of every top college and professional school in every field have studied, worked, practiced, and drilled. They've been continually inspected, and finally, they've been selected. This is what it means to join the meritocratic elite. So maybe now it's somewhat less about who you know and more where you've been. For most of us, the effect is the same as ever. Wealth gets concentrated in the hands of a shrinking ruling class, and everyone else has to work for them. However, now even the wealthy are working their asses off. What a waste of money. They don't even coast through school anymore. If wealth can't buy freedom from work and school, what's the point? There's only one thing left to buy. In a meritocracy, once you have the nice house and car and stuff, you need to look like you deserve to be where you are, or at least deserve to have more. That look, that appearance of deserving, is prestige. The wealthy buy prestige. Remember the college admission scandals? Rich people, ashamed their children might not be meritocrats, paid to get their kids into elite universities like Harvard and Stanford. You might think, but they're rich. Their kids don't even have to work if they don't want to. Uh, but then the child would have the stigma of only having inherited their wealth. You know, trust fund kids, and therefore not really deserving it. That's why I say meritocracy is even bad for the wealthy, who are under more pressure to achieve and thus maintain their position at the top. 
They have to work as much as the rest of us now. So the system we live under may or may not be meritocratic, depending who you ask. Either way, having looked at several visions of meritocracy, one thing we know is, it's shit. We shouldn't want a meritocracy. Still dreaming of equality of opportunity? Can I interest you in equality of access? It means everyone has access to everything. You know, everything that isn't your private stuff. There's no way to work out exactly whose contribution is worth what, and no one deserves to go hungry, so everyone should have access to everything produced. That also means everyone should have a say in what's produced and how. So the consideration is no longer what's profitable for the few who own, but what's right for everyone. Some people scoff at the idea and say, no one would ever do any work if we weren't forced, but we're still forced by nature, so it's not like we're going to stop making food and building homes. Just that we wouldn't be forced to do whatever work the people with all the money want doing, so we'd have more time to do stuff as free people. If you say the only way certain things would get done is if we're compelled to do them, maybe we shouldn't be doing them. But if it's something necessary or enjoyable or rewarding, people will do it. We don't need to be duped into following some huge carrot on the end of a stick our whole lives because there's a tiny chance we'll deserve to catch it one day.